Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm now delighted to introduce our speaker today, Leah Davidson with Can Do It, a local software company. Um, they make a software product, I believe, that uh, it has to do with experiential learning. It's a big buzzword in, the, in education circles now, so I am uh, excited to hear what she's got to say. Leah, please. Hi, my name is Leah. Um, I can talk a bit about, can, are you able to hear me? Is the mic um, Can you hit the switch on that mic? Yeah, in the top middle. You can almost tell it. I'll get you. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then it'll come on in a second. There it is. All right. Is it better now? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm happy to share a bit more about and what we're building and some of my entrepreneurial journey. So I'm originally from, well, I was born in China and I grew up in a small town in Quebec, Canada. Went to school at the University of Pennsylvania in the US um, and then worked in consulting and startups for f a few years before starting my own, my own venture. And uh, Candor was based on the, my own problems that I faced in college. Um, I went to a really good school, but I was a first generation college student and I didn't have many mentors or family members in business. So it was really hard for me to figure out, kind of navigate the landscape of um, choosing courses and figuring out what path I wanted to pursue. So I ended, like when I was applying for internships, I ended up applying to consulting, marketing, finance, just anything that I was eligible for. And I didn't have a good idea of which path was, was right for me or what was a good fit. And then also most of the process, of, so our college had an on-campus recruiting process where all the companies come on campus, they, you send in your resume, you get slotted in for interviews, so you could be interviewing at four to five companies per day on top of classes back to back, and then kind of traveling around the country for those final round interviews. So it's quite a stressful like few weeks, and a lot of students you know, get depression or burnout or get a lot of anxiety because of that process. And I realized that you know, rehearsed networking and formulaic interviews weren't really my strong point. I was more introverted and it was hard for me to shine in those settings. And also no one really had prepared or coached me to excel in that. And I felt like a lot of what I had, I was a really hardworking student, but a lot of what counted inside the classroom didn't seem to matter during the recruitment process. So it was just kind of how well you could convey what you had done in your own words. And your resume is basically that. It's like a, your own version of what you accomplished as opposed to what other people thought about your work or actually the outputs of what you did. And I wanted to change that process. And so I went through like 50 plus interviews. It's really hard to get an internship. Um, and then when I got full-time offers, the companies had like sell days. So they would fly us back into their kind of headquarters. We get wined and dined and they convinced us to try to sign the paper. And so I mean, some of my peers even got like Tiffany jewelry, or they got like um, <laughs> like popcorn and like steady breaks in the mail, like before finals week. Like uh, so, anyways, the companies really went all out, like delivering chocolates. Like it was it was quite interesting. But um, that whole process wasn't a very good portrayal of what firm was the best fit or what role was the best fit. So I ended up in a job that sounded good <laughs> on paper, but then I was really unhappy, and um, and they were like. It was like a, I wanted to go into consulting and it was more a data science consulting firm and they were like, oh, you'll pick up SQL and you'll like it. And I really didn't. And I was uh, wondering, like, could we catch that earlier and could we figure out before a student ends up in a position whether it's a good fit for them or not? And also, why is most of what you learn in college like so disconnected from the real world. So there's the academic side, what you're learning inside the classroom, what the professors are teaching, and then there's career services, which is trying to help you get a job. But those two departments, and now that we've talked to over 30 universities, they don't communicate with each other. So like, they don't really know what the other person's looking for. And there's no way, like if I'm a student and I, you know, maybe, like I founded several student organizations, but like that wasn't captured during the recruitment process. It's, and I, you know, Got a lot, like mostly A's on my coursework, but like that again, it, the hard work and the teamwork and all the skills I had developed inside the classroom didn't really matter so much to recruiters as much as I, how I could spin the story. And I, I wanted to change that. And so what we created is Can Do It, which is a, an online digital platform which allows companies to connect with students for short-term projects. A lot of these products are integrated into coursework at the universities, so we're able to partner. We mostly work with business, um, technology, design, um, 
career paths. And so we are able to embed those, core, those projects for actual real world businesses into the school curriculum. So the students are getting hands-on experience. Sometimes it's outside the classroom. So the students are working as part of student organizations or they're working as like on their own for either course credit or outside of class. Our goal is to tie all of our projects to a scholarship component. So um, the money that the companies are giving, we take a portion for our operating costs, but the rest are given to the students who are doing the project. So um, there's like a $1 trillion debt crisis in the US, for, and so we're trying to help as well students afford their education. And a lot of companies look at our platform as a way to kind of get project work done that they don't otherwise have the resources for, but also as a talent solution. So it's a way to pipeline talent for your organization. So by doing a project inside a classroom or multiple classrooms around the US, since we work at around 30 universities, you're able to see like where are the best students coming from and use that work sample as a good way, as like an extended interview to figure out which students should you interview for internships or full-time positions. And we have, a, our platform basically consists of like a, a marketplace, although it's not really a marketplace because we take a very proactive role in matching the company to the right university for their needs. Uh, and then there's like online project management tools. So a lot of our projects are virtual, but if they happen, we do work with UNL <coughs> here in Lincoln. So in the case that there is the opportunity for in-person interactions, a lot of the times the businesses come in to present to the classroom and there is that like interactive component as well, maybe like a site visits or um, other aspects. And then um, there's also an experiential resume. So all the students have profiles where they can upload the projects they've done for different classes or extracurricular activities, even internship projects. And they can also get solicit feedback from the people they've worked on. So peers, professors, other employers. And then so as an prospective employer, what you would get is um, a more comprehensive view of what the student is capable of and what they've done in the past, and a more 360 degree view of how do people find working with this student. So we have like public and private feedback, some for students' personal development, and they're able to create a career roadmap and see how am I filling gaps in my resume. If I want to be a marketing manager, we can kind of screen at the marketing manager positions at the entry level or marketing analyst positions, say what skills and competencies you generally need to be competitive for those uh, positions in terms of prerequisites, and then how are you progressing on those dimensions as you complete more projects on our platform. Um, so now we've done around 50 projects. I can talk a bit, uh, we've worked with um, all kinds of universities from community colleges to Ivy League universities. Uh, we now have worked with, uh, in five different countries and we also worked with smaller businesses, nonprofits. We've worked with larger companies like Uber, Marriott, the NFL. Um, some of, so I guess my own entrepreneurial journey uh, started when full time about a year, a bit over a year ago, uh, we received a grant from the Chilean government to actually pilot our technology in South America. So I moved to Chile. It was supposed to be for three months, but we got an extension, so I ended up staying there for eight months. Um, and Chile is actually a really good environment for entrepreneurship because the government gives not equity-free grants um, for if, if you're willing to live in Chile, which you know it depends, I guess, on what other commitments you have. But um, they have like programming on getting started, an accelerator program where you get mentorship, different workshops, and also help in piloting your solution in South America. So we talk, I think I talked to around 15 universities in Chile and we ended up piloting at around three of those universities and we have another like five to eight on the waiting list. Um, so we matched those classrooms with, with, uh, with businesses to do projects and the concept of experiential learning in Chile was much less advanced than in the US. And a lot of times what we found is the students have, don't, there's no, concept of on-campus recruiting even, so the students are really descending in their resumes and only the students from the top universities get interviews for jobs. So if you don't go to one of the most prestigious universities in the country, you don't necessarily have a shot at a lot of these, com at a lot of these companies. Also, it's, that's also biased based on your socioeconomic background, so if you come from a richer family, you can afford the more elite universities. And then if they don't get an internship, a lot of times they have to repeat their whole year to try to get an internship the next year because you have to get those credit hours to graduate. And then a lot of the positions require one year of experience and there's no way to get experience without experience. So then there's like a catch 22 situation again. And so a lot of times they even leave the country <laughs> to try to get that experience and come back to find a job in Chile. And um, so that's a lot, a lot of the problems that we ran into. And so 
a lot of the actually all of the universities we spoke to in South America were very receptive. And now we actually, after Chile, uh, moved to Peru for an accelerator program at UTech Ventures, which was at a university in Lima, and they're an engineering university. And we also found that there's a lot of talented technical students in South America who can work on projects with US companies. And for them, it's a really good like win-win situation because the students have trouble finding jobs locally, but they're really talented developers. A lot of them speak English, um, and they can do work remotely. And you know, for a company in the US, it's a lot cheaper for them to work with students in Latin America, but for the students in Latin America, it's a much better wage than what they would get locally because just the cost of living is much lower. So we actually are starting to pilot programs where we're pairing some of the top engineering students in South America with US-based companies that have different project needs. And um, yes, and now we've done around 50 projects uh, throughout the US and we're starting, we're continuing to grow out that business. Uh, we relocated to Lincoln, I think in uh, July, August, as part of the launch link, launch LNK. So it's a grant program from the government to try to bring in businesses from out of state to work with businesses and universities here. And we've also been part of various other programs. We were, my co-founder is in Chicago right now with Acumen Civic X Accelerator. So we're one of the f 10 future work ventures in that program. We also did a tech diversity program in Tampa, so we, with, which is sponsored by the Nelson Foundation and Tampa Bay Wave, which is a co-working space in Tampa. So we connected with a lot of the universities in the Florida area. Um, our mission is really also to help under-resourced students, so students from diverse backgrounds. Um, since I was a first generation college student, my co-founder grew up in a low income family, African American, and so we, all, we kind of faced some of the barriers in the educational and um, job market, and so trying to help students even outside of the um, kind of equalize the playing field. So we want to prove to a lot of co larger companies as well that the best students are not coming from necessarily the top universities, but there are good pockets of students everywhere. And if you're able to design a more meritocratic system for recognizing that talent, um, you will ultimately be probably hire the right people more. Um, and our system allows you to do one project on multiple campuses as well. So for a larger company that has a lot of recruiting needs, we can kind of have them do it at diverse universities. We can even remove the identifying features of where the students are coming from, and they're able to see based on the project work, like who is the best fit for this job and who should I interview. So if you could go to a small university in the middle of nowhere, but you are really talented, you're a really hard worker, you can get your foot in the door in a way that you wouldn't if you had just got your resume passed through the screener looking for like keywords. And yeah, I think it's been an exciting journey so far. We're around seven, a team around seven people right now. Um, we're actually in the process of hiring a CTO based uh, in Nebraska, so that will help with some of our technology needs. And we're also designing some artificial intelligence, like data analytic tools that will help students with the process of matching them to the right jobs and companies finding the right candidates for those jobs. So we want it to be more of a talent solution. We have some strategic partnerships with um, that want to bring their students over to our platform as well. So that could, as we're talking about a couple of like 30 to 50,000 students coming on potentially next year, which is exciting. And um, I think a lot of the problems that we realized, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think a lot of the problems that we realized in the university system is that university enrollment around the country is actually on decline, and I think that's partly because of rising tuition costs. There's a lot of online education options. And so a lot of universities are now turning to experiential learning as a way to bring in and attract more students. On the company side, it costs around um, $4,000 to hire an entry-level candidate. And so one third of those employees leave within the first year. So it, it really benefits the organization if they're able to invest in hiring and supporting the right students. And they're also supporting the educational system at the same time by giving these students real projects to work on. and getting in front of those students earlier can build employer branding for when the students are looking for jobs later on. And on the student side, a lot of times, around 40% of recent college grads end up underemployed, and they end up in jobs that are not related to their degrees or what they're studying, um, and maybe they don't even require a college degree. And so this kind of connects what they're learning in the classroom. Even if you come from a liberal arts background, you can still get that hands-on experience. So when you're putting out your resume, you have some work experience to showcase. Um, and our upcoming goals, so usually when we do it inside a classroom, there's a professor who's the person who's signing off on the project and they're overseeing it to make sure it's up to the standards of the company that we're working with. 
but we're also working on a program where we can bring in community mentors who can mentor individual students or teams of students outside the classrooms who want to get that experience as well. And yeah, our, our motto is that you can gain experience without experience, and we really want to help yeah, students get that access and get in the right positions and succeed in the job in the job market. And we're really excited to be in Lincoln, kind of connecting with the community here. I know I've got a ton of questions. <laughs> um, first of all, help me understand. Okay, you work with companies, you work with uh, colleges. Who all pays for your software? And, and does the student pay a fee to use the software? And does the company pay a fee? And does the college pay a fee? Where does the revenue come from? Yeah, so the students never pay for the technology. Um, we are talking to some universities about a licensing agreement, but it really depends. Like, we also do a lot of free engagements with universities. Depend, like, if they don't have the budget, we still, we still work with them. Usually the companies pay a fee, and then that we take a portion for operating costs, and then the rest is given to the students who are working on that project. Okay. And then another question I have is, with the current low unemployment, and almost every company I talk to is scrambling to find people to work, um, does that really help your cause? Uh, is a, for companies to use your product as a way to recruit new talent? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of competition for talent right now, and so people are going, like we're seeing, especially that ones that have recurring needs for students on uh, coming into their organization. So a lot of the larger corporations are investing a lot. The campus recruiting industry is a $10 billion a year industry. And that's like the career fairs, the flying people out for interviews, like all of that, like courting students, um, early exposure programs, like those are all expenses that companies are incurring trying to get in front of students sooner and getting them to join. So I think we are seeing more. And there's also a big push for diversity in organizations. So we're able to help. We work with some like historically black colleges and universities and some uh, ones that focus on like women's colleges or un underrepresented groups. So we're able to help companies achieve their goals as well when it comes to recruitment and selecting students. Do you have any statistics on the success rate of these students with employers like the link? Um, so we're just like a year and a half old, and we pro so we don't really know yet. We do have some students who are like have gotten jobs or internships out of those engagements, but we're not. We have, I guess it will take a while for us to be able to measure like long term retention and satisfaction. But we've gotten good reports on the projects from like the feedback forums of students who are when we're talking about how it's improved their skill development or their. Um, industry awareness and also the employer's satisfaction in doing projects with their students. We tend to be pretty involved, I mean not on a day-to-day -day basis, but um, make, checking in to make sure the project's going smoothly or you know, if there's any issues, trying to catch those early so that we can get like expectations aligned and um, move the project kind of on the right path. Could you talk a little bit about your, uh, your launch challenges in, with respect to, to reaching out to a universities as well as the employers. Um, you talked a little bit about the uh, billion dollar, $10 billion industry. Um, so how, what was your pitch? How were you going in and able to successfully bring, align these businesses with your, uh, with your product? So my co-founder has around 10 to 15 years of experience in recruiting. So he comes from that industry and is very familiar with he has like a network of contacts, so that helped a lot. Also the programs we're, we're part of in different geographic areas put us in touch with the businesses and the universities in those areas. So we didn't, we didn't know anyone when we went to Chile, and the sorry, Chile program helped us get in touch with those universities. Here in Lincoln, we got connections with Doan um, and UNL and some of the other universities based on you know, people, just our network and connecting with people. Um, now we're getting some people kind of reaching out to us after hearing uh, presentations or reading articles about what we do. Uh, I think we definitely are like want to reach companies at a larger scale. So either larger corporate partnerships or just reaching smaller businesses at a larger scale. I think on the university side, there's a lot more capacity for projects. So it's just getting that, that deal flow coming in in terms of the, there's a lot of students who would love to participate and the more businesses, products we have, the more engagements that we can do with the students. Um, what we do sometimes if we don't have like a lot of individual projects is we'll have the whole class working on one project for a company or we'll do the same project on different campuses to give more students that opportunity. 
you said earlier, if I understood you correctly, that when you were in Peru, you, your goal was to reach out. You got two or three of the top universities, and then a statement or so later, you made the comment that a lot of the students that are in second and third tier colleges or universities. How are you reaching out to them now, those colleges as well, so that those students can get internships? Are you starting to work your way down into tiers of levels of colleges, or are you still up at the top? Yeah, I think like in the U.S. we've been pretty diversified. Um, in South America as well, we, we had quite a bit of a wide range. I think getting a few like of the well-known universities is always helpful just to you know build the credibility of the platform. Um, and then once those are on board, we, we we're really open to anyone to participate. And a lot of times when we have companies that come to us, sometimes they have biases like they want to work with only where their alumni where they graduated from college or the you know colleges in their local ecosystem. But we can also sometimes like squeeze in some other schools if they're doing the same project and actually then maybe change their mindset about where they're looking for talent since it's pretty clear if you're having like social media, you want students to design a social media campaign, and you're actually looking at the results of that campaign, like there may be a really good team of students at this university that you hadn't thought about. So we're, since it's actually work-based in this setting, then it, we're able to actually you know, do more in changing assumptions and getting diverse students or students from less traditional backgrounds in the pipeline. Are you able to find international companies here in Lincoln? One that comes to mind to me is like Lycor, even though they're nationally based here, they're international and all over, and they're actually multicultural in terms of their employee base. Are you able to find those kinds of companies here in Lincoln that you've been able to draw, I guess, for colleges around the world? Yeah, I mean, we definitely um, have been trying to reach out. We're <coughs> definitely open to more connections. I think developing our network here in Lincoln is taking some time just because we're not from the area. So um, we're a part of like Fuse Coworking, and we don't go to some of the entrepreneurship events. And the the person who runs the Launch L and K program, Christina Oldfather, she's very involved in the entrepreneurship community. So she's been connecting us to people. But um, we are looking to get, like especially companies that have more of a budget or I mean have more cyclical hiring. Those are good targets for us because they may do projects annually or they may have recurring business needs. But we can also do it with smaller companies as well that may have like one-off projects or just not have the capacity to do everything that they need to do internally. So that's a lot of, like I'd say our larger companies look at it more as a talent solution and then like our, the smaller companies that maybe just they have business needs that they don't have time for. They need someone to design a website or they need someone to take care of a marketing product, do market research or just like these smaller engagements. Can you give me an example of a project maybe done locally um, that went through your platform and, and what type of work was involved from the student end and what they were doing? Yeah, um, so we've, I mean, we're just kind of starting the conversation with UNL, so probably those projects will be for the spring. Um, some of the other projects that have been done, so we've had students uh, do, um, uh, do um, user testing of like websites design new features for websites. We've had students design logos for businesses. We've had students do um, like different research, uh, like interviews, surveys, uh, market research in their communities, um, internet research. We've had them do like social media campaigns, run social media pages. Um, we've had also like students do like strategy consulting. So sometimes the business will come and they just want more ideas of how they can grow revenue and they want or how they can cut costs and they want kind of more of the creative energy of the students and doing their own research. So a lot of these students actually end up going to like top consulting firms after graduating like a year out. So but while they're still in school, <laughs> they're, they just want that experience. And so you're still getting a lot of their, um, what they're, they've been trained to do through their studies. And so we have a lot of classes that do client consulting work as well. Um, so anything in the business consulting area. Um, this is maybe tangentially related to like your <coughs> experience and area expertise, but do you have any insights as to like all the factors that have contributed to the exponential ballooning of college, you know, tuition and living costs and all that? Because one thing I know about is over the past four years we've kind of kept the hiring steady or even dropping off slightly of professors uh, relative to student body populations increasing enrollment. But then you look at the administrative side, that on average, like a typical 
administrative growth over that same time period is like 10 to 30 times. Like, I don't know if you see any other symptoms along that kind of line that maybe you could address, you know, through something like can do it that can. You mean like the tuition costs going up? Yeah, I mean, because your company helps make things more efficient, <laughs> right? You know, like make the person or an academic mm -hmm. science kind of uh, synchronized a little bit. I don't know if you've got anything others, you know, like what could keep costs, you know, either steady or just reduce the increases, you know, because we see yearly increases everywhere in tuition. Yeah, I mean, I think what we're trying to do is take out some of the administrative work from the universities because a lot of them have these people who are manually trying to find projects and for their students to work on and it's kind of a full-time job. So by creating a scale more network effect, we're able to help companies recruit across the country and not just form one-on-one -on -one relationships with universities. And then the universities tra track data more centrally on how their students are doing. So I guess one thing, a lot of the universities have like these internship feedback forms, but they're kind of in paper documents or they're scattered everywhere. And like, so they're not using, capturing the data on how their students are progressing in terms of career readiness. And so we're helping to centralize the data reporting in that area. And I mean, I think in terms of like, hopefully we're with, yeah, we're able to like just Add, like add more capacity, like technological capacity to to um, accommodate a lot of the like if a, if a professor, for example, wants to implement an experiential learning course, they don't need to do it from scratch. They can look at projects through our database, and so ho hopefully that provides some sort of efficiency in the long term. Have you ever looked at like red teams or like working with the DoD or anything like that? Um, we haven't. No. Do you have a website? Yeah. So it's um, www. Can do it. C A N D U I T. dot C O. And if there's somebody here that has that works for a, a little bit bigger company and they might have a project that students can work on, do they go to the website to get that to get signed up? Yeah. Um, also, my my email address. They can contact me by email, which is my first name, L E A H at Can Do It. dot C O. And that's a good way as well to set up initial conversation. We usually just start by talking about what the project is, what type of students they want to work with. We have undergraduate, graduate, um, students from different academic backgrounds, students from different types of universities. So when we have a better idea of what they're looking to achieve, whether it's local or na international or national, um, we can help them find the right university group to work with. We do tend to work on a semester basis so that like now that we're already in the semester, it's harder to fit something in like right away. But um, we're now preparing more, I guess, for the spring. And then we do have occasional opportunities if they need a, something on a more pressing basis. Any other questions for Leah? William. How many people support that software set up? And how crucial is it to the actual service? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not really like a software that you're installing. It's more like a software as a service. So it's like all online. So it's just like a website, basically, that you, everything is housed kind of on the cloud in that sense. Uh, and a lot of times, like, it's not mandatory that you use the technology either. If you have other conduits of channels, um, our technology has different features for that help with managing remote projects. So if you want to assign deliverables, if you integrate with Google Calendar, um, set up meetings, do like chat or like we have like a slack like feature on the software so that kind of helps if you're not physically with the students uh, but if there's other channels at work that's fine as well since we're not dealing with a thing that can be held in hand could you speak briefly to how you manage to monetize it how you figure out what do we charge these companies what are, you know, I don't know I don't yeah know that question real clear a bit yeah, I mean, it's definitely something we're still working on. Um, we have some like standard or like recommended fees, but we're pretty customized as well, depending on what they're looking to gain, like what their budget is. I think as we scale and we find out more what the willingness to pay is, um, it is kind of a, we do kind of based on what people are normally paying for an hourly rate for students or, or um, interns. So we kind of base it on like expected number of hours the students working on it and calculate the project fees. But it's still flexible and fluid. And I think as we grow and do more projects, we'll be able to better assess like, what are the right rates for different types of businesses and knowing that a startup doesn't necessarily have the same resources to pay as a Fortune 500 company. And our packages for the larger companies will probably end up being more subscription packages where they can do a certain number of projects annually. Um, 
or we're trying to get like larger, like recurring amounts from those companies that want to sponsor students on an annual basis. But then for smaller businesses, we may be able to like do it more on like how many hours do they need from students, like how long is the project, how complex is it, that type of thing. Any other questions? Now, Leah, thank you so much yeah, for being yeah. here today. We appreciate it. <laughs> As a thank you, we'd like to present you with a Focus Suites mug to take with you. Yeah. Ooh, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, that's it for today. Uh, there's no need to run off, though. You're welcome to stay around the space as long as you like. Walk around, check out our resident businesses, uh, exchange business cards, meet somebody new before you go, or come up and ask Leah more questions if you have them. Thank you for being here. We'll hopefully see you next week for Luke's presentation. All right.